Hello everyone, my name is Brendan Moore. That noise you're hearing is my ventilator, and welcome to Page Turners They Were Not My Star Wars Podcast. Today, I'd like to talk about Return of the Jedi and its place in 80s film. Now, I have talked a bit about where Star Wars falls in the history of American cinema. Uh, Star Wars being part of the auteur cinema of the 70s. And I've talked about how The Empire Strikes Back coincides with the downfall of the auteur cinema. Return of the Jedi comes out in a very interesting place. And I have not yet discussed it, and so I thought I would today. Depending on who you ask, the end of New Hollywood, or the American New Wave, the auteur cinema, came as early as 1980 and as late as 1983. Uh, most most would agree on this point. Some would argue that that Star Wars was the downfall of auteur cinema, but you know these things always take time. In the history of cinema, it is considered that Heaven's Gate in 1980, one of the most colossal financial failures of all time, led to the demise of New Hollywood cinema. In my own opinion, it didn't happen overnight. It was a slow decline. For me personally, I believe that really the last of the auteur cinema came in around 1980 or 1982, with the last movies of this era being movies like Blade Runner, in King of Comedy in 1983, which is one of Scorsese's films that didn't do very well at the time. Which, uh, by the way, I would recommend highly, uh, The King of Comedy. The King of Comedy came out in 1983, the same year as Return of the Jedi. So where does Return of the Jedi fit in the history of cinema? I would not consider, well, I guess you, I would consider, come to think of it, that Return of the Jedi is part of that auteur cinema. But it's a little bit different when it comes to Star Wars because the success of the original film caused George Lucas to be able to go independent with uh, some of the troubles behind the scenes of Empire Strikes Back to quit Hollywood altogether and become an independent filmmaker. And because he's an independent filmmaker, he kind of exists outside of auteur cinema. And the reason I say that is, well, let me be clear. It's not outside auteur cinema. It's outside the New Hollywood wave. See, as I mentioned recently, Hollywood started to discover in the late 60s that these auteur films were becoming very profitable. So they turned their attention to that kind of cinema. When Evans Gate failed, Hollywood went, okay, we we got to uh, we got to pull in the reins here and not allow the directors to just run away with their visions. And so they seriously curtailed that. George Lucas, however, because he quit Hollywood with Empire Strikes Back, was beyond their reach anyway. And his films are going to be profitable no matter what. So Hollywood wasn't really in a position to curtail 
his work. And the truth is, because he was independent, the production of the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi were beyond Hollywood's reach. All Hollywood was doing with Fox was distributing the movies, but having no say in their creation. So, George Lucas, even though New Hollywood had died, was continuing to make his vision with the Return of the Jedi. And though it was directed by Richard Markland, a man who I feel does not get enough credit, George Lucas is really the one who was in charge. So it's his movie. Now, that's a very long-winded way of saying, even though the auteur cinema was dead in Hollywood, George Lucas, because he existed beyond Hollywood, could be an auteur. Now, Return of the Jedi fits in sort of this craze in the 80s of fantasy films. Now, Star Wars is a fantasy. But to be clear on that, Star Wars is a fantasy. It's a space fantasy, as it is, it is termed. In the 80s, not only was there a huge upswing in sequelitis, as I discussed on last week's podcast, but there was also a, a, an interest in these fantasy films. You may remember a lot of them. Let me list off some of the titles. You have movies like Excalibur and The Dark Crystal, Conan the Barbarian, Labyrinth, The Neverending Story, Legend, Willow, Krull. The list goes on and on. Now the odd part is most of these movies were neither a success with critics nor a success financially. So why did Hollywood keep churning them out? Okay, churning them out sounds rather negative because many of these films now are viewed in a much, much better light. But what I mean to say is why was Hollywood making so many if a lot of them were financially unsuccessful? And I think like any trend in, in Hollywood, money talks. And I think at the beginning of this 80s fantasy film craze, they were proving to be financially successful. Conan the Barbarian and Excalibur were financial successes. Conan was quite a success. And I think that Hollywood saw this and went, okay, let's go with this because these movies are profitable. However, most of the ones that came after were not. Now, I believe that maybe The Empire Strikes Back and Star Wars, which came out kind of before this craze started, of fantasy villains were kind of the progenitors of that. Star Wars, as I say, is fantasy, and so everybody was kind of trying to do the next fantasy. At least that's my hypothesis. But a lot of them didn't want to just copy Star Wars in terms of being a space movie, but make them more traditionally fantasy. Uh, movies like Dragon Slayer, which unfortunately was not a financial success, but did come out kind of in the wake of Excalibur. And, you know, a lot of these films, as I said, were not well received when they came out. But have grown quite a nostalgic audience over, over time. And I can't help but think that Return of the Jedi fits into this. Return of the Jedi is a fantasy film involving lots of creatures. You know, it's the most creature-centric of the original trilogy. I think George Lucas... He has said in interviews that 
now that Star Wars had established its identity, he could play around with it a little more. And that's probably why you get strange creatures like the Ewoks and and the weird denizens of Jabba's palace. The Rancor and, and other strange creatures. Admiral Akbar and the Mon Calamari and things like that. Where really they went to town with the creature. Um, now it's interesting to notice if you look at the 80s fantasy films that the early ones like Excalibur and Dragon Slayer um, and even Conan the Barbarian aside from a, a few creatures you know Conan had the giant snake and uh, Dragon Slayer of course had, had Vermithrax, the big dragon Aside from that, there weren't a lot of creatures in these movies. But then you get The Dark Crystal, which came out a year before uh, Return of the Jedi, which is an all-creature feature. And after Return of the Jedi, you get all of these, you know, never-ending story, Willow, Legend, which are the never-ending story, Willow, and Legend. Let me slow down a bit. Huh? Which are creature features with lots of neat makeup, lots of cool you know, creatures that, that just are really much more adventurous with going beyond just in your standard fantasy films. You know, sword and sorcery having a lot of cool effects uh, that involved creatures, that involved monsters. And I think that Return of the Jedi fits into this world. Now, I don't believe that Return of the Jedi has as big of an impact. And, and maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way, but... I am not inclined to believe that Return of the Jedi has as big of an impact on cinema as the previous two Star Wars films. But, it's, it's really hard to say how different our world would be without Returning the Jedi. We know that without The Empire Strikes Back, or at least in my theory, Star Wars would not be the phenomenon it is today. If there weren't those sequels. But I think that Returning the Jedi, at least in my own mind, doesn't it wasn't as, as big of a deal with making Star Wars the big franchise it is, but I don't know that for sure. There's really no way of knowing. Now, it is unfortunate that during the making of Return of the Jedi, things were, did not go well for George Lucas himself. I'm not going to get into that here, but if you want to know more, you know, definitely check out Al Star Wars kind of in the universe. Return of the Jedi, I think, definitely may have been responsible, and go with me on this, may have been responsible for the monster creature effects, heavy fantasy movies that would come out afterwards. I think it is highly likely that the success of the film and this neat uh, cornucopia of creatures caused a lot of fantasy filmmakers to go, ooh, let's let's try some really neat effects here. And arguably, you could trace that back to maybe the success of Yoda. It is possible that maybe the Dark Crystal would not exist which, as a, you know, fully Muppet movie. No humans without the success of Yoda in the Empire Strikes Back. So I do believe that Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, but particularly Return of the Jedi, played a part in making creature heavy fantasy films a common thing, a common. Uh, 
uh, element of 80s uh, cinema. And I think that I certainly grew up watching a lot of these 80s films, and I'm sure a lot of you did. Two, and just the just the fun of them, just the sheer um, joy that I get out of watching movies like like that. And it's not really that a lot of them are what I would call really, really great movies. I think the nostalgic factor is there. But more than nostalgia, I think that um, there's, a, there's a feeling there that you don't really get with modern movies, and I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. Whether it is the whether it is the creature effects that are practical, whether it's the music, which let me just say really quick that Stranger Things. To me, one of the things that makes it successful is it, it goes with a music style that, that was sort of that synthesizer sound that's very 80s. And I think without that, it wouldn't feel as authentically 80s, even though, of course, it's, it's not from the 80s. But I don't want to lament too much for those lost days. But I do miss them. And, and I think Return of the Jedi plays a part in this, in that particular uh, part of film history. And definitely, I know Return of the Jedi is a very important film to a lot of kids who grew up, and that was their, maybe their first exposure to Star Wars, and one of their earliest exposures to Star Wars. Now, many of you know, I used to be kind of sour on Ewoks, and, and I kind of went with the old Gary Kurtz idea that they're only there to sell toys and things like that, which, by the way, Gary Kurtz, who'd been Lucas's longtime producing partner, basically was fired after going way over budget on The Empire Strikes Back. Kurtz, unfortunately, didn't have some kind, he didn't have any kind words about Returning the Jedi saying it was all just a big marketing thing for George Lucas to sell toys. And I used to kind of be of that mindset, especially with the Ewoks, but now I completely reject that. I love the Ewoks. I love Return of the Jedi. Now, for me, it is the weakest of the original three, but that in no means, in no way, is meant to be an insult Saying it's the weakest of three amazing movies is like saying which of the Toy Story movies is the worst star Toy Story movie. You know, it's it, it's it's not a a question that can be answered in the same way as saying like three bad movies. You know, when you're talking three good movies, it's like how do you pick the worst quote unquote worst one? But I'm very happy about the Returning the Jedi's place in film history. I'm glad that it was a success. I'm glad that it introduced some amazing new worlds to us. Not just worlds, but just, I think, expanded the palette of Star Wars, if you like. And I can't help but think that its success played a part in those wonderfully nostalgic 80s fantasy films. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Brennan Marr. That noise you're hearing is my ventilator, and thank you for listening to Page Turners They Were Not, my Star Wars podcast. May the Force be with you.